Well, good morning, everyone. Well, the rest of the country seems to be uh, iced in. So God's blessed us with only dreary, cool weather instead of ice down here. So we're fortunate compared to talking to some of the people around the country. I began a series. I didn't know it was going to be a series when I did it last week. But as I, as I was going through, I realized there was a few things that I just didn't feel like I covered in depth enough in understanding what I was talking about. The sermon, in case somebody gets this sermon and hasn't gotten the other one, it's called in the company of nobility. And I was covering that subject because there was this couple of scriptures that I felt that were misapplied or possibly didn't go far enough in depth that the church had always taught. Not that they were necessarily wrong, but they just didn't go into depth enough to try to understand, which kind of played down something that's extremely important in our value of appreciation and worship back to God. And it was showing the difference between our calling in a scripture where God says he's not a respecter of persons. And, and, and that is true. And we went through a, a number of scriptures showing how God is not a respecter of persons. But at the same time, there is a special purpose for some people's lives that everyone doesn't get in this lifetime. Which doesn't negate what God said as far as not being a respecter of persons. But because we look at it, he's not a respecter of persons. In other words, we all have things all equal. Well, that's not the way it is with God. God is not with all things equal to everybody because you can see through the parables like he would give some so many talents. And if that was the case with God, we would all be like pencils. Everybody would look alike. And the truth is, when you look at the scriptures, you see that that's not what God means and that's not what he intends. You go to Revelation, where we went through that scripture, and in Revelation it says, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. In other words, there's a separation of blessings and opportunity that God's going to give some people that others do not get in this lifetime. It's that simple. And so everybody's not, and so as we as a nation, and one of the mistakes that we continue to make as a nation is we try to apply principles to bring about prosperity that are in total opposition to scripture, and we can't understand why things won't work. Well, that's the same way it is sometimes with Scripture. If you have an understanding and you haven't given it the depthness of understanding and thought that you need to, then you limit yourself as far as what God is trying to teach. But God says you're not going to come to him the way you want to. It's going to be on his terms. So let's go to Exodus 19 and see what God says. So the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Now, in that little sentence, two things just happened. There's a separation, and there's an instruction. So God says, listen, get the people ready to come to me. You sanctify them. In other words, you're setting them apart for a holy purpose. Jesus Christ says when he called you, he sanctified you also. That means, just like the children of Israel back then, you have been set aside for a holy purpose. To come to him. And in that, there's an instruction. And sanctify them today, tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. So they had three days that they had to prepare before they came before the Father. You had six days. From the day you left last week from the humblest today, beginnings, you had six to days to prepare to, to come before ships, God. Packed up everything they owned. Did you prepare? Did you? Did your mind been washed? Has it been cleansed? Have you put on your best garments? And are you ready to come before God to hear His word? Because that's what we're doing, believe it or not. See, they came before a mountain to hear God. You have something special going on. You get to go to the throne. You get to go before the very throne of God. Now see his requirements? Do you think that we can go before God any way we want? Now God's showing us that, that you have to spiritually, emotionally, sanctify, be set apart, to have your attitude ready to be able to come before his throne in a way that he can accept you. And so when you come before the church today, like I realized for the first time, I haven't asked God before. God, will you accept me today in your presence? 
in a humble way that, that only he can. Now that's important. Every week, I promise you these little tidbits that I give you of information that if you just do these little things, your life will change. Now, I don't know if you remember one I gave you last week, and I said, I promise you, if you do just one thing, your life will change this week. If you realize that God is with you every minute of the day. Every minute when you're about to make a decision, and you look over and God's right there. When you're about to have a certain thought, and His Spirit reminds you God's right there. Every minute of every day, if your mind will realize that God's presence is with you, because He says it is, he said, when you're repentant, when you become baptized, he leads, he guides, he directs, then he's inside of you. That that spirit, whether inside of you, or if you're at the verge of considering being with God, that he's called you, his spirit leads you. That means his presence is around you. You did those, just that, that one thing. Every time you're about to make a decision, ask God to have that conscience say, God's presence is here. I promise you, your life will change. Every day for the betterment. You begin making better decisions. You'll have less of the problems that I'll talk about today. And part of the problems I call is, is residual, the results of residual sin. Because you see, that's the next thing that can hold you back from worshiping God the way you want to, or the way you should, is the result of residual sin. All right, so, and I got a couple examples about that. So let's go on here. So they said, be ready to come down for the third day, for the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai, and you shall set bounds upon the people round about, saying, take heed to yourselves that you go not up unto the mount, nor touch the border of it, for whosoever touches the mount shall, shall surely be put to death. So God puts limitations on us. In other words, what we're seeing here is there's a boundary. God says, this is as far as you can come, and this is the way you have to approach me. And that's where we're at. We have, we're, our boundary now is what? The throne of God. But it's going to be His way. You try to do it any other way. You try to step over that boundary. And what did God say? There shall not a hand touch it, but it shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. It shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come to the mount. Your trumpet sounded at your calling, whether you realized it or not. When you began looking through the scriptures and they began to understand things that you never understood before. When you began to hear a preacher preach one thing and you're looking at the scripture and see it says something else. Your trumpet sounded whether you realized it or not. And God says this is as far as you can come. And you come to that throne and he sanctifies you. And he gives you his Holy Spirit at, at, uh, at repentance and baptism. And now you're in the presence of God. And he expects us to get ready before him, to wash our clothes, to get our minds in order to come before him. This is a scripture we've always used in talking about clothing. Of course, and I want to use it today. I'm going to go to Matthew 22. And in verse 8, it says this. And we've, we've used this scripture over and over and over. And it's, it's a parable about reference to the kingdom. But you're not going to get into the kingdom if you don't change your life today, as always. is the extent, and it is taught correctly, by the way. And God uses a parable about dress. All right, so in, in Matthew 22, verse 8, he says this to his servants. The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. He says, go into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. So the servants who went to the highways, and they gathered together as many as they found, both good, bad, and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Now we know the parable, we understand that's talking about Israel. And Israel rejected God. And so God went to the highways. And he wouldn't gather anybody else. We know the time of the Gentiles that would come in. And we understand the parables and the principles. But you know what we miss? We miss the personal application of what God's applying here in our lives. Because we look at the big picture and we forget that it's also applying to the personal picture for you and I. All right, so now he furnishes it, and he says, And the king came to see the guests, and there he saw a man which had not a wedding garment on. All right, so then I, I, I take, and I look at this, and I think about the things that I hear the people say, 
You know, you can come before God any way you want to. You don't need to dress up. I said, well, I guess I could. You know, I remember <laughs> I went to visit with somebody. And, and I went into his house. And he had, he had images of all the different gods that he could find in his house. It was the strangest house. I was over with, another, with a friend of mine who was in the church. We, we got called out to her visit. He wanted to talk about the church. So we went and visited one night. And I'm looking at the house when I walked in. I was like, and I'm telling the fellow who's with me, he says, this is the strangest looking house I've ever seen. And what I didn't recognize at first when I went in, what he did is on one side of the house, he built it to look like the Buddhist. On one side, he looked like the Muslim. And all the different houses and sides of the house, each outside was for a different religion. And I didn't realize that going in what I was looking at because it was so strange. The guy was very wealthy and he worked for NASA and he was a physicist. So, you I mean, the guy was brilliant. So we went in and talked, and in his mind, he was reaching a point of knowledge that he could approach God on his level, not God's. And we, I mean, it was going through, and I was, so before we even began, I said, listen, this is the only authority that I use to discuss the truth. Because he was wanting to talk about all these other religions. I said, if you want to talk about them, that's fine. I'm not going to be here. I said, you asked me here to talk about Jesus Christ. And he said, this is the only authority we have. And so we went through the conversation. And what became clear, and eventually I just shut the book and I left. I said, listen, this is, this is dangerous. Because the man believed. You don't need to come before God in your best. And he was like, I could sit on a toilet in my drawers, as he said. And I could talk to God and have him in my presence while I'm on the stool. I said, that's enough. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. But he believed, he honestly, in his own wisdom, believed that he could go before God and have God come to him on his level. Because he was reading about all the different gods and he had so much knowledge and so much understanding that it surpassed man that he reached God's level. I said, this was insane. This was insane. And no doubt he was a knowledgeable man. There's books everywhere. And when I heard him say that, I, I left. And you know, you can talk to God that way. Even David was accused when he was praising God, he took off all his clothes. And I'm sure he was in his undergarments and he wasn't in his royal priest, priestly kingdom. But I don't think he was out there totally naked. That would be against the principle of God and that wouldn't have been acceptable before God. But in other words, God looked at his heart. And so his king's robes were gone, I'm sure, and he was in his, his undergarments or whatever other garments that he had at the time. And so, God can accept that. But the attitude is here, is that he didn't have a wedding garment on this guy. In other words, you don't have the authority to change God's standards to come to him on your terms. See the point? So when we come before God today, the point is, are you coming to God on his terms? Can he accept you in his presence? Is your attitude of the humble, contrite heart to thank Him and praise Him for all the wonderful things that He's done for you in your calling to make you special. David didn't have a whim about saying, God, you have wonderfully made me. I mean, you have done great things for me. You have given me all these great blessings. We don't, as a church, do that because we sound like the rest of the world. <laughs> so we don't give God His praise and thankfulness like we should because we don't want to sound like them. And we don't want to sound vain. And so we don't. But I think we need to spend more time, if we can't do it openly yet, to some degree, then at least do it privately. Because you need to praise God for the wonderful things He's done for us. And we can't come in to His presence. Now this is talking about the kingdom. But I'm talking about daily His presence before His throne. All right. Look at 1 John 1. Look what it says. Well, I could finish in Matthew 22, but, you know, we've been through that. Look what, you know, where he said, to bind him up and take him out. So you think you're going to come before God and you're going to get in on your terms? God says he'll take you out. You're going to bind your hand, foot, many a call if you were chosen. You were chosen. Look at 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, you can come before God and thank Him for being righteous. Thank you 
God, that you have made me righteous. When's the last time you prayed that? Not that you're righteous. He has made you that way. Right? If you have, and that's, this is where it gets really hairy, because we don't want to sound like the world. But at the same time, let's look at it in, in, in realistic terms. God has removed your sins. He has taken out the old man. He has placed his spirit in you. That means his presence is in you by his Holy Spirit. Are you not righteous and holy if his presence is there? Why not tell him so? Thank you for making me this way. Now, the danger, what's the danger? Hey, I'm a righteous and holy person. I'm a pretty great person, ain't I? No, you're not. You're rags and filth before God only because he does this that you are looked at in that way. You see the dangers in the cross pattern that could happen here? And so we take the one side and remain humble so that we don't sound vain. And at the other side, we, we don't take the time to praise God for what he did do. You ever done something for somebody who went out of your way and it really took a lot of time and a lot of work and you don't get a thank you? I know we've all done that for people. And how do you feel? It doesn't make you feel real good, does it? It's like, wow, the people just don't appreciate what I did for them. How about your boss, the people you work for? Everybody goes out of their way for their company all the time. It's never seen, it's never heard. But it takes it to keep your work going. You do it, why? Because it's inside of you, because God gives you that desire. Do the people in the company know? Most of the time, no. When you do go out of your way, sometimes you get a thank you. Most of the time, you don't. You do it anyway. You see, once in a while, shouldn't we take a little bit of time and thank God for what he did do for us? He has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. So if you've been cleansed from all unrighteousness, that means that you are righteous. If God dwells in you, he makes you that way. We can thank God for that. King David did it. But David's heart was, was correct in the way that he did it. He thanked God. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he that blots out the transgressions for mine own name's sake, and I will, will not remember their sins. So when you come before God today, what does he see sitting there? person who gets this tape, no matter where you're sitting, you might be sitting on your living room couch, watching the sermon. What does he see sitting there? I'll tell you what he sees, whether you realize it or not. If you are in His presence and He has accepted you and allowed you to be at His throne, He sees a righteous, perfect, complete individual. Now, that's hard to, to imagine, doesn't it? That's what He sees. Because He says He's removed all your sins. And if you've come before Him in a humble, righteous way and asked to be here, you know what that means? That you have spent time in repentance this week. Because, because the Spirit's going to bring that to mind. And you're going to be asking for forgiveness. And when you come before Him today, when you make that prayer, say, God, please allow me in your presence today. You're going to know that you have no authority to do that on your own. It's only by His will. And you have that humble, contrite heart. And the Spirit will be there. And if there's something that you did what's wrong, you know what that Spirit's going to help you do? It will help remember if there was a sin that you hadn't repented of to bring it to mind to repent so that when you come before His throne, it's a merciful thing that God does. He helps us to remember what we do to cleanse us to come before Him. And when He sees you, He isn't seeing you, He's seeing you through His Son. And He sees His Son as perfection. And you're the image that He sees through that. When Jesus said, I and you, you and me, and we and them. That's how He sees us, because you can't come there on your own. Only through the presence of His Son. Now, isn't that worth praising God for? That you come before Him in a way that makes you look perfect before Him. Because Isaiah says, from God's own lips, I will not remember their sins. Now, we're not that gracious to do that. In our minds, we want to remember sins. We remember other people's. And we remember our own sometimes to our own detriment, to our own detriment. When you're preparing to come before God, 
it's really important to have your state of mind in the presence to be aligned with his Holy Spirit. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Because you see why you come before God, you know what else is going on? Not only do we sometimes beat ourselves up, Revelation chapter 12 says this, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. Now imagine Satan's out there accusing you. God can look at him and say, I don't know what you're talking about. He's looking at you and so there's perfection. Why? Because he says when he forgives you, he remembers those sins no more. They're removed from you. He takes them aside and he's buried. And they're put aside for one special day. It's called the Day of Atonement. That when, when he comes back, he's going to take that, all those sins that's been removed and he's going to place them on the head, head of that accuser of the brethren day and night. And he's going to send them up. But before God's throne, he says, I don't remember those sins. He sees you in a way that we can't see ourselves yet. But if you can see yourself in the way that God sees you, you can praise God. Because it's, it's like I remember when I first came into the church, I never forgot of the way it was in a sermonette, believe it or not. A little, just a little sermonette. The sermonettes, are, if they're done right, they're incredible because they're only 10, 12 minutes long. And they have a little vignette or story that it tells about a scripture. You know, sermonettes aren't made to have 10, 15 scriptures in them repeat over and over and over again. They were designed to tell you little stories to help a speaker develop his speaking ability to be able to convey a scripture and, and expound upon that scripture. But we want to take the other way. When you, you know, tons of, and expound on just the Bible instead of a scripture. But the person made a very eloquent story about a person who's on his deathbed. And he's going to go before, the, before judgment and he's, and he's about to go into the electric chair. And he was very eloquent the way he strapped the person down. And he was watching. He was listening to all the stuff that was going on. And you see the man walking through the wall and grabbing the switch. And as the man was about to pull the switch at the electric chair, because of the man's sins, what he had done, a man puts his arm up and stops him. And we understood that would be Jesus Christ. But he didn't stop there. He walks over to the chair as he painted the story. And he unstraps the man who's in the chair. And he sits down and he straps himself in. And he tells the man at the switch, pull the switch. And that man died while the man who was in the chair watched him go on. I never forgot that story. He painted a story because, you see, until you can put yourself in the position that Jesus Christ died so you don't have to sit in that chair, it is just a religion. It's not your conversion. Because you see, Jesus Christ died for you. And we don't preach that enough because it sounds like it's Protestantism. But it's not. It's scripture. It's your calling. And that's worth it on Saturday mornings before you come to church to say, Thank you, Father, that you've forgiven me. And I don't have to sit in that chair and, it, and, it, and let him know how much you sorrow that he had to go through what he went through because of you. It becomes personal. It's one-on-one. -on -one. And I never forgot that. And every now and then when, you know, when I'm going through repentance, that story comes back to my mind on how that person, and I, and, and I try to picture myself in that chair because it says the wages of sin are death. And realize that I didn't have to take that, that chair that Jesus Christ did. And to realize that he voluntarily sat in that chair, strapped himself down, and he pulled that switch and died so that I didn't have to. I mean, that story needs to be told over and over again. And I don't care if it sounds like somebody out in the world. Jesus Christ did it. Let's praise him for it when we have to. And I'm not talking about hoopla and all that. I'm talking about deep, heartfelt, sincere appreciation so that when you come before his throne that God knows your heart how it is intent on the, the, the gift that he gave you and the freedom and, and what he has in store for you for that first resurrection and I can't imagine yet what that's going to be like I'd like to but I just can't I just can't picture it we sat around here yesterday after the, the, 
the news crew, the, the media crew left and everybody's sitting around. And we just started talking about different things and trying to imagine in the throne room of God Almighty before anything existed. Because the Bible says that he created everything out of nothing. In that throne room, when they're planning the blueprints to lay out this world, the universe, your body, with billions and billions of cells before it ever existed, and then sit back and say, okay, to his own, the one that become his own son, all right, go build it. Imagine what that's going to be like to see that. I hope that we'll sit there in the kingdom one day, in the millennial reign, and we get called to Jerusalem, and we'll get a chance to watch the building process. in some video form that God has that we can see what went on. Wouldn't that be incredible to watch nothingness and see what he started with and build it out of nothing? Wouldn't that be incredible? Well, I think we're going to have that opportunity to be able to go through that. All right, so going on. I, I can see I probably won't get through all my scriptures. And by the way, the last page is just a, just a reference for you to be able to take home and start reviewing when I get to the last page of the scriptures. I want to talk about now the, the next thing, which is the last important thing of the sermon. It's coming before God with baggage. Residual baggage of sin. Because God says you remove sin, right? But we carry things on. So sometimes, I want, I want to go through a couple of examples here, that you can, you can sin before God and be forgiven, but you're going to carry the scars with you of those acts. You realize that? And so what Satan does is he brings those scars to light. And then what it does for you is it brings you to the past and tries to have you keep living in the past. So I want you to do something for right now. Close your eyes. All right, everybody close your eyes. I'm not, no tricks. I'm not going to sneak up on you. I want you to build a box in your mind. Build a box in your mind. I got my eyes closed too. Now, I want you to build this box and in this box, I want you to be specific. You're just going to start it now, but when you go home tonight, you're going to work on it some more. Picture the sides going together. You need a lid. You got a way to secure it together. Take some time to really build this box. It's important. Put a lid on that box, and you're going to have a lock on it. Now, I want this. I want it burned into your brain. If you want to open your eyes, you can open your eyes. But go home tonight, tomorrow morning and keep building that box so that every time Satan brings up a past that God has forgiven you that he's trying to let you live in that past and replay that video over and over again in your mind I want you to take that video and put it in that box you just built lock it up throw it away whenever Satan brings that video up your mind will see your box that box will see that sin is gone. It's removed. It can no longer hurt you. You no longer have to live with the pain of what that did. Even if you're living with the consequences of the residual sins that it caused, the sin is gone. It can no longer hurt you. Because God says He forgave you of all your sins in the past. No matter what they were, He forgave you and you're going on. So if Satan, who's the accuser before God's throne day and night, brings them up, you can look, so that's in the box. If it's one you haven't thought about, take it out of the brain, put it in the box, and get rid of it. Don't replay those videos over and over and over to keep you in the suspense of the pain of the past. Use that opportunity that in it's removed, as God says, and he remembers no more, to look and say, that was a learning experience, I'll never do that again, and you move on. And let the pain become a positive tool for your future. Because if you can't, you know what's happened? You're letting the sin outweigh the forgiveness of God. You see how important that is? Because God says He forgave you and forgot. That means you have to do the same thing. You have to forgive yourself enough to go on. Now, you're going to live with pain. But you can live with that pain to the betterment to the future. And I've got a scripture here for, Dan, for about King David. It's on the next page. You know the story, so let me go through it real quickly, but there's a couple issues in this I'm going to bring out that are very important for us to understand. 
It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. So the Lord sent to, da to Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and he said, There were two men in the city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had exceeding flocks and herds. The poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew together with him and his children. And he did eat with his own meat and drank with his own cup and lay in the bosom, was as to him as a daughter. And there came a traveler to the rich, with the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock, of his own herd, and to dress for the wayfarer man that was come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and he dressed it, for the man was to come to him. And David was angry. You can see how, how angry, when you, when you put things in black and white before you, sometimes you see how clear they are, but inside your mind, they become cloudy. And you react to things that aren't scriptural. And when you do that, you make decisions that are not based upon principles of God and you run into trouble and sometimes you don't know how you got there. It's because you haven't put the principles of God first. All right? So, David's angry. David's anger was kindled greatly against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man that has done this shall surely die and shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. Now, at that particular moment, David's mindset changed very fast. And that's the way God's Spirit works with us. That you'll be in a state of mind and you don't realize that maybe you have stepped away from the presence of God. And the next thing you know, you're in trouble and you don't know how you've gotten there. But I promise you one thing. If you stayed in the presence of God and your mindset was in the presence of God, it would not move away from God. That's why I said last week, if you just did this one thing, every second of every day, realize that God is with you, your life will change. Now David got away from God's presence. And that's where he got into trouble with Bathsheba. And when he heard of unrighteousness, it angered him because he was a man of righteousness. He was a man who loved God. But he got away from the presence of God and he did his own thing. So here's Nathan now. And he says, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your bosom, and I gave you the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And if that was too little, I would have given you even more to such things. Wherefore, you have despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, you have taken his wife, and you have slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. David didn't have a leg to stand on. David didn't try to justify what he did. If you're in, a, if you're in the state of mind, you're trying to follow God, you won't be busy trying to justify your actions. You won't. You will admit if you made a mistake. And you will ask for repentance. And if you could get into that state of mind, that humble spirit, I, I guarantee you your life would be different. It would be better because immediately repentance is important. The more you justify, the more problems you create. You, know, you can't justify your actions before God if they're ungodly. He's not going to listen. And you know what else? There's a principle that God says. You got something against your brother, and your brother got something against you. He said, you go straighten it out first. So if you think you're going to come to church and have something against your brother, or well, you know he's got something against you and you haven't tried to work it out, don't think you're going to come here in God's presence. He's going to accept you. Because God says, don't come before me with that gift. You go straighten out your mess first and then come back and talk to me. So it's very important that our mindset be in tune with God. And so we don't have the luxury of harboring ill against another person. doesn't matter what they did to you. You have to forgive them. And you have to go on. Otherwise, God says, don't come before me in my presence. I'm not going to have it. He says, go take whatever it is you got and leave. We'll get that straightened out and then come back. So it's a state of mind that God's talking about. Now verse 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Wow. Now this is very important for, for what I'm talking about here. That's why I bolded this in the print. Is that whatever you have done in the past, broken marriage you know, who, I don't know you know I don't know people's personal lives and I'm glad I don't because I, I don't want to know that 
When people come to me and they want to talk about baptism and they want to talk about their past, I, I tell them I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I tell them, listen, you need to confess that to God. Now, if there's anything I can help you with, let me know. But I don't want to know a person's personal sins of the past. I don't want that in my head. I, don't want to, I want to be able to stand before this pulpit with everybody I see or whoever hears this that I can give a sermon that's pure, that I'm not pointing to anybody out there because I knew their past and I'm picking on you. Now, I know lots of times people say, well, you were talking about me today. I said, no, I'm not. And I can honestly tell you, I don't come up here to pick on any person. So in, in, when it comes to your past, you need to go before God because your past will linger if you don't get rid of it. So when you come before God and you have sinned, let's suppose you stepped out on your husband or your wife and got caught and it broke up your marriage. Now, God forgives that. But you live with that broken, broken marriage, won't you? The children may hate you the rest of their lives because of what you did. In other words, you can do things that God will forgive, that Satan's going to bring back and try to trouble you for the rest of your life. What I'm telling you here is that box that you're building in the brain, in your mind, take whatever it was. If Satan's throwing it at you, put it in that box and realize that you can put it aside because God forgave you for that. Even if you have to be like King David and live with the repercussions of that sin. It doesn't have to be the stumbling block for the future. It can be your foundation for growth because you realized your sins of the past, and the deeper the pain, the less likely you'll ever do them again. Because it's deeply embedded in your brain. That's why I want you to build that box in your mind, because it's, well, you're gonna put it before God's throne and leave it and let him bury it somewhere. Whatever your past was so that you can go before God with praise and with joy, and I've known people that I had to counsel who were drunken drivers who went off the road and killed people and imprisoned the rest of their life to let them know that God can forgive them. They may never get out of prison in this lifetime. And the families that they killed, those people, will never be the same because of that act. But yet they can find a way to go on because it's whatever it is. And you need to burn that in your brain, that forgiveness. Your sins are personal. So whatever they are, whatever they've been in the past, they don't have to prevent your future. And you can praise God for that because he's given you that opportunity. That's special going on. All right, so here we have now verse 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. The rest of his life, the church, the, the, his family never had peace. The church of God, since the changes from the families of the Armstrongs and the problems, whatever they had, the breakups that went through, the changes of doctrine, the bringing in of outside doctrine that's not of truth, had wrecked the church of God because of that, and to this day it has never found peace. You realize that? And it won't find peace till God returns. Now, God says when he has accomplished the scattering, but there's something else we need to understand when he says that in Daniel. God doesn't scatter because of, of just he wants to do it. Usually something brings that about, and it's normally because you haven't done what you're supposed to do. It's obvious in the New Testament. He told them, go to the world. They didn't go to the world. They stayed right where they were. So what did God do? He brought them persecution and sent them to the world. Same way with the church, because the church didn't do what it was supposed to. It began to lean upon its own whatever. And you can have your stories. My, my stories are, are good from worldwide. I enjoyed being in worldwide to the day they threw me out. <laughs> I did. I really did. I learned a lot from them. I enjoyed everything I learned from them. I enjoyed the Feast of Tabernacles. I thought it was a great experience. When, when things wasn't looking right and I asked, started asking questions, they threw you out. Well, until then, I still had a, you know, a nice, I don't, still don't have anything bad to say about them. I, I, I learned, and you know why? Because I appreciate my calling. I learned the truth through them. And if it wasn't from them, I don't know if I've ever learned the truth. And so I appreciated that. But the residual p 
pain of what it caused carries on in many, many families. Many, many families. The United States would have never had a civil war had it lived by its own constitution from the time it was founded that all men were created equal. But because of a few people said, no, we want to keep slavery in America, the United States lives with the problems of that decision to this very day. It's residual. You break down the principles of God and you pay a price even if you're forgiven. Look at, look at Abraham and Sarah. Look at what goes on today around this world because they didn't wait on God. They wouldn't took, use the concubine to fulfill God's promise when they weren't supposed to. Because of that decision, the residual pain carries on through this day. Look at the Middle East. Those are brothers from way back. Two different gods now. And that'll never stop till Christ comes back. So in your life, there may be things that you're going through that God says you're forgiven. Put them in that box, lock them up, and put it away. Dwell on whatever positive can come out of that. And, and you will be richly rewarded before God. Because now you're dwelling in the mercy of God, not the sin of the past. And I looked at this, and not only was his house not at peace, you can see what happened in verses 11 through 13, how his, uh, his wives were taken. And God says, listen, it'll be done in front of everybody. So everybody in the nation knew what was going on in his own household. And the child that he loved died. All because he stepped away from God. It's, a, it's a, an interesting story. So if, if you're going through things in your life and you have a question, your forgiveness, God forgives. Lock it up, put it aside. If you don't accept that forgiveness, then you don't accept the blood of Jesus Christ. That's simple. Finally, let me, let me close with just the scripture here. This last page I wanted to just leave with you <clears throat> so that you can take it home. It's talking about the walkness, the newness of the new man. Because you see in, in Romans 6, it says this, Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, with Christ, is, that the body of sin may be destroyed. Henceforth, we not serve not sin. Or is you don't have to live in the past no more. Whatever Satan was doing as your, as your accuser and bringing up in your mind that you can't seem to let it go, let it go. Accept God's forgiveness and go on. Don't do it again. But don't take that forgiveness so lightly that you just casually move back into the same sin over and over and over again because at some point God's going to cut you off. But you do have to accept that he's forgiven you. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You can come before God and thank you that you made me this new creature, perfect in your sight, without sin, because you've removed it. And you can stand before God and say, Man, how greatly have I been made and how wonderful you've, you've given me. I can walk in peace and joy that you've removed all them burdens. And you can feel lifted up that you can come before God and rejoice because the past is over. And your today is a new day, and you can move on and praise God for that. That's special. And we in the church don't do it enough. We need to do that more often. Because then you're living in that newness that he's telling you. To walk in that newness. Because in that newness, it's free of sin. It's free of bondage. It's no longer stuck in the past. You're walking in the newness of Jesus Christ. That's special. And because you do that, he's going to give you a chance to be a part of that first resurrection. To rule and to reign with him. Don't take that lightly. So you can go through Ephesians and you can go through Colossians here. And, and you can pick out and go through. And I wrote all those scriptures, those down for you. Or I copied them down for you. And I want to conclude with the very last scripture in Colossians 3 and verse 15. So when Satan tries to trouble you with the past, you come before God next Sabbath. You think about it all week long as you're preparing to come before him and, and let this happen and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you are also called in one body and be you thankful. We are the most blessed above all people 
the most thankful people we should be of all the earth. We've been called, we've been chosen, and we are a part of the first resurrection. Blessed and holy, God says, is he who has part of that first resurrection. And with that joy, it should be unspeakable. And if you have that attitude, when you come before God's throne and you ask him next Sabbath, Father, when I come before you today at services, will you accept me in your presence? God will, will with joy say, come, chosen of my Father. We've been called.